Okay, thank you, Beth. So first, let me say welcome to everyone that's on this um, Zoom meeting. I think it's going to be exciting and beneficial. I think Beth and Triangle Art Arts work for inviting me to present today. Um, I think it's going to be beneficial for all of us. I'm not going to delay. I'm going to get right in. We have a long presentation, so I'm going to try to get to the end. Again, um, put your questions in the chat box. Beth will fil filter those questions out to me at the end of this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. So again, <clears throat> everything you always want to know about charitable solicitation licensing for arts work. Okay, we're here to serve you. One of the things that we want to stress to everyone on, on this Zoom meeting is that, you know, no matter what your question is, CSL, the Charitable Solicitation Licensing Division, we are here as a resource for you. We focus on compliance. We're here to answer all the questions that you have. And if we don't have the answer, we'll definitely we'll find the answer. But mo for most part, we can pretty much answer any question that you have as it relates to charitable solicitation. So just a general overview, these are the things that we're gonna to try to cover today. Um, a little bit about CSL, some definitions, registration criteria, exemptions, um, what constitutes a, an executive director as it relates to the solicitation, renewals and extensions, the application process, insufficiency and denial notices, disclosures, record keeping, using professional fundraisers, enforcement actions, best practices and some common mistakes that we see on applications. Um, let me ask you a question. Can you see our, my screen? Yeah, so yeah, we cannot see your screen. So you need to share um, and we apologize. We, we, it was a little crazy before we got in. So we, uh, um, we're, we're starting a little abruptly. Um, so Gail, you wanna share your, you should be able to yes. share your screen. Okay, can go. you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. So these are the 14 bullet points that I have, I've just narrated as to what we're gonna be trying to cover today. So I'm gonna to go to the next screen. Okay, so before I talk about this, this screen here, this slide here, CSL, we have a staff of eight. And as anyone knows, when you have a small staff, you have limited resources, but you are responsible, responsible for a massive amount of work getting done. So I'm really proud of the staff that we have here and their capabilities. This chart here, if you notice it, it's about business creations for the Secretary of State from 2014 all the way up to 2021. I'm gonna focus on the last two years here, 2020 and 2021, mainly because those are the years that we encountered COVID, we're still dealing with COVID and some of the um, impact that it's had on businesses and nonprofits as a whole. For 2020, business registration had 126,600 newly created businesses or businesses that they manage, right? So those businesses accounted for $141.4 million in revenue for the state of North Carolina. If you go down here, you see the appropriation was very small, 14.1 million. And that has to cover a lot of different things that's going on with the Secretary of State. So the point that I want to bring out here is that the Secretary of State is doing a lot of good work in terms of helping businesses get started and, and um, serving those residents of North Carolina. Here in 2021, you can already see that we've already surpassed this number for 2020. And it's projected that we may have 186,700 businesses created for 2021 time uh, fiscal year. It's projected that we may have $159.2 million in revenue for the state of North Carolina. Again, all of this work has been done with the limited, limited staff and lim limited resources. But nonetheless, we realize the value for the state of North Carolina. 
Okay, so what is the purpose of charitable solicitation licensing division? What we do here, we maintain a registry of organ organizations that are licensed to solicit charitable contributions in the state. Not only for the um, organizations, but we also license and regulate nonprofit, I mean, um, professional fundraisers, those who solicit and assist organizations in raising money. The third component of CSL is that we also have an enforcement section where we are responsible for those entities that may not be in compliance, working with them to seek how they can get into compliance. So we regulate nonprofits and those who are not in compliance. What is a charitable contribution? For our purpose, a contribution means a promise, pledge, grant, anything of value or financial assistance that an organization uses in solicitation. So we know what a contribution is, anything of value, but what about what is not a contribution? We do not count membership dues. We do not count membership fees or assessments. We do not count funds or monies that you, the organization being a nonprofit, receive from a federal, state, or local government in terms of grants or contracts. Also, um, many of you may receive funding from an organization like United Way, another 501c3. So those funds are not counted toward the contribution uh, level also. So what is solicitation? Again, you know, the definition was anything of value that you, re you receive in response to a solicitation. So what is solicitation? Solicitation is any request or plea for money or financial assistance or gift. Anything of value that we use for the benefit of the charity. Again, uh, we're governed by North Carolina General Statute 131F. Those solicitations can be written or oral, usually require registration. And so again, we're going over definition. So what is registration? And that's a process where the benefited charity and the professional fundraiser who provide financial or other information about solicitation activities to our division to see if they are required to be licensed or if they're required to be exempt. Now, how do the community use this information? The public likes to know um, if the organization has been vetted to some degree, what kind of contributions that they're asking for, how those contributions are gonna be used so they can feel good about giving to an organization that meets their criteria, who they feel they, um, they have familiarity with. For instance, if someone wants to give to those for clean water, those who have medical conditions, those who are serving veterans. So anything that, that's germane or special to your heart, those public entities want to know that those contributions are gonna be used for that purpose. So who must register? Generally, organizations and in individuals who intend to solicit contributions in North Carolina must first obtain a license. However, there are some exemptions to this. Um, North Carolina has 13 different exemptions that an organization may qualify for. And if they qualify for one of these types of exemptions, they are not required to have a license, yet they can continue to solicit contributions at the same time. Okay, exemptions. So this is some of the exemptions here. You have your religious organizations, you have your government, local, state, federal, you have educational institutions, you have some hospitals and continuing care facilities, like public radio station like UNC, um, I mean NPR, you have volunteer fire rescue squads. One thing I want to focus on is the one that I have bold here. Organizations with less than $25,000 and contributions in a physical year and no paid officer, trustee, organizer, incorporator or fundraiser. And what I mean by this officer here, um, one of the questions that the document examiners get often is that um, what constitutes an officer and if they're paid or not. 
And it comes down to whether or not they're going to be qualifying for an exemption. So what we did, uh, we decided that we'll go ahead and explain to a lot of the nonprofits that we work with what constitutes an officer as it relates to charitable contributions. Who is an officer or executive director, sir, director's officers? And so we use the IRS instructions for Form 990, and it defines what an officer is. It also defines what an executive director is. And for those instructions, you can find the definitions um, on the current set of instructions on page 26 and 27. And here's a link to that as well. According to IRS definition of an officer, um, is any person elected or appointed to manage the organization's daily operations? And I'm gonna skip down a little bit. The offices of an organization are determined by reference to its organizing document bylaws or res uh, resolutions or its governing body, which is the board normally, and um, otherwise designated consistent with state law. So here, IRS give you a clear definition of what an officer is, but it also, also goes and say, officers can include a president, vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, and in some cases, a board chair. For the purpose of Form 990, including Part 7, Section 8, those of you who, are, who feel um, complete a, a full 990, the regular 990, you are familiar with Part 7, Section A, because this is where they list out the different types of officers there. And IRS treat them as, uh, they said, any officer with the following titles are treated as an officer. Like number one, the top management official, the person who has ultimate responsibility for implementing the decisions of the governing body or supervising the management, administration, or operation of the organization. For example, the organization's president, CEO, and it specifically spells out executive director. Often we get a question that executive director, even though they're compensated, they're not an officer or the organization, but according to the 990 from IRS, an executive director is considered an officer for this purpose, for solicitation purposes. And then number two, it says, um, in the event you don't have one of these individuals listed in number one, the top official, the person who has ultimate responsibility for managing the organization's finances, for example, the organization treasurer or chief financial officer. So that's a clear definition. And a lot of times we share that with people and then they have a better understanding as to why CSL says an executive director is counted as an officer, particularly if they're compensated. And so it goes to the point that if they are compensated, then the organization does not qualify for an exemption. I, here, I just did um, a portion of that page, part seven, part A. Here in section C, you can see where they list down the different type of officers. And I put an example, what we, we see on those 990s. Say for instance, um, Gail A. Lua, the executive director, checked here, compensated, do not qualify, qualify for an exemption. Trustee, you checked, you being compensated, you do not qualify for an exemption. Same thing as an officer, check here. So if this area is checked and there's compensation here, then the organization does not qualify for an exemption. This is just a generic uh, definition of an executive officer. I think most individuals understand the roles of, a, of an executive officer and that a lot of time they're carrying out the functions and requests of the board itself. Executive officer uh, continued. So what we did here in CSL to help the document examiners in communicating with nonprofits uh, when they have this question about an executive uh, uh, a director we ask three clarifying questions. And if the answer is yes to any of those, then that way they know out with certainty that they do not qualify for the exemption. So number one, did the individual serve as an executive director at any time during the organization's immediate preceding tax year? So we're in 2021. So in 2020, if they served in any capacity, whether it's just five months, three months, four months, if they served in that role, and the answer is yes, then you know, they're considered an officer of the organization. 
was the individual or the previous executive director responsible for implementing the decisions of the governing body, meaning the board, or for supervising the management administration or operation of the organization for the immediate preceding tax year? If the answer is yes, again, then you qualify as an officer. And then the last question that we asked is, was the individual or the previous executive director um, compensated during the organization immediate preceding tax year? Then you do not qualify for the exemption. Okay, so in scenario one, scenario two, you can be an officer, but you may not be compensated. And if you're not compensated, and if the tax, if your um, contributions are less than 25,000 and you're not compensated, you qualify for an exemption. The third category here is that if you are an executive director and you were compensated, and even if the, the um, level of contributions um, were 15,000, which is under the $25,000 threshold. But if you're compensated and you're an officer, you do not qualify for an exemption. Okay, so the next question becomes, are there benefits to registration? And this goes back to the view of the community, um, those donors. The donors want to know that their funds are being used um, according to the purpose of the organization, the purpose of which they're giving it to. And so having the organization registered in our uh, registry is a good way to let the public know that CSL has done some type of level or, or some level of vetting of the organization. We're not going to say that we um, are scrutinizing their board governance or how they operate on a daily basis. Just, just some basic criteria that we are requiring those organizations to meet. And so when they're in our registry, it says to the public that they have been vetted to some degree on some level so the public can have a, an assurance of some type that the organization more than likely will be using those funds according to the purpose that it has narrated. Okay, registration requirements. If an applicant received contributions um, less than 5,000, even if they did compensate and did compensate an officer, they're required to have a license, but there'll be no fee because their uh, level of contribution is so low. And we do have this scenario happening occasionally. We don't have it often, but there are some entities who, you know, for they just start up the second year, third year, they may not really receive a lot of compensation and for uh, contributions. However, they listed down that they compensate. Whether they actually did or not, they said they compensate on the application. Therefore, they're required to have a license, but they do not have to pay a, a fee. Now, from $5,000 in contributions for less than $25,000, and you did compensate, again, a license is required. Um, $25,000 or more, a license is required. If you don't compensate and you make less than $25,000 in contributions, you qualify for an exemption. If you qualify for an exemption, it's your decision as an organization or executive director to decide if you want your organization to be registered and be listed in our registry. Again, there are benefits to being in the registry, but it's your choice. You are not required by law, by the statute, to be listed in that registry. That is your decision. Okay, so here again, do I need to register? If I do not have a 501c3 status, um, not all charities have a 501c3 tax determination status. They have not submitted an application 1023 to IRS to be uh, designated with some type of 501 status. So in this, um, scenario, the registration is based upon the level of contributions and not your IRS status. So it doesn't matter if it's monetary or any kind of donations or both. If your level of contributions exceed $25,000, you are required to register with us regardless of your tax determination status with IRS. And the second scenario, charities that do not have a 501c3 status can solicit charitable contributions, but those charitable contributions may not be tax deductible. 
So that's one. That's the main difference there. If you have stat, tax five hundred one c three status, then um, those contributions are tax deductible. If you don't have it, they're not tax deductible. But nonetheless, in any case, you still can solicit charitable contributions. Okay, so where do I register? To register, you must complete and submit an application to North Carolina Secretary of State Charitable Solicitation License Division. And here is the link there. And also what I would say um, on the, under this link here, there are a lot of different resources. So sometime I will just take time and go on the charities and see the different um, options that I have. You have the statutes there, you have uh, resources there, you have information about licensing, you have FAQs there. So you have a lot of resources available to you on this website under the charities division. Okay, so how do I submit an application? Right now we have two ways you can submit an application that's by paper or online. And recently we went through a six month modernization project where we're doing more things electronically. And what we found out is that uh, we're able to work with the charities better and more efficiently. We're able to respond to them quicker. They're able to send information back to us faster. We can process their applications a little bit better and more efficiently. So we are sliding um, away, moving away from paper applications as much as possible. Uh, we, haven't, we have not arrived yet with the 60, 40 percentile, but each year we're growing in online submission. And so the paper application, you, you will mail in all your supporting documents, including, in, including your payment. With online filing, you can do everything online in one shot. You need to upload, upload your supporting documents. They must be in a PDF format. It does not work well with Word. Um, you can go, you can uh, start application, save it. Say you get interrupted for some reason, you can save it. You can go back in, continue filing, start, uh, pick up where you left off to finish that application. You can go ahead and pay online by credit card or electronic check. You can up, you can check your uploads, see what was there. If you need to make any amendments, you can do another thing. You can do that online as well. So anything you need to do pertaining to your application online is ideal because you have all the information there. It keeps track of what you've done. You don't have to worry about a question, what did I submit? You can view it yourself and you would know what you submitted. Whereas paper application, you would have to rely on what we have and what we have scanned in to see what was submitted. And so, but we encourage everyone to try the online filing and move toward that because of the ease in application and processing. Okay, so what constitutes a complete application? The application process is not complete until you have submitted all required document, documents, um, paid all the required fees and su submitted the notary page. So the notary page, this again was a major change. At one time with online filing, you could not submit your notary page. Well, we changed that effectively um, July of this year, July, 2021. Um, so the entire application for online, including the notary page can be done in one setting. Uh, whereas the paper applications, you mail your notary page in with that application. And in either case, whether it's online or paper, the signature page must be original signatures. What I mean by that, for online application, it's a scanned copy of the original signature. It cannot be a digital cop digital signature. So that's what I mean by original signatures there. Okay. So with any application process, sometimes things don't go quite as we planned. And there are some occasions where we, the document examiners, have to ask for additional information, missing documents, um, clarification on, on information that has been submitted. So in the event, if you were to receive an insufficiency notice, and it's going to come by email, it's not going to come by mail, it's going to come by email. So your email addresses are vital uh, for them to be accurate. So you have 30 days from the time you receive that insufficiency notice to submit any required documents that the document examiner is asking in order to continue to process your application and to have a successful outcome. Now, in the event that after the 30 days have run and you 
fail to get the information in that, that the document examiner is requesting, then the next notice that you get would be a denial notice. Denial notice says off a couple of things. One, um, again, it's issued if um, you don't supply the information that's, that's needed. Um, at the end of that process, you will be required to submit a new application. Along with the new application, you're going to be required to pay a new licensing fee. You don't go back and get the licensing fee for the denied application. We've already processed it. It's denied. Um, the next thing is now you subject for late fees, which is going to start, start to accrue. Once that application is denied, $25 a month is a standard late fee. So here, um, what we try to do is we work as much as possible with the organization. If there is some reason or some cause that's causing some issue that's causing you not to be able to meet that deadline of 30 days, the best thing I would say to do is call the document examiner. Let them know, please, may I have a couple more, you know, days or week, weeks, one or two weeks to finish my information because I'm waiting on, on something. But communication is key. Again, we in CSL, we want to stress compliance. It's more important for us to have compliance going on versus um, denial notices, having the organization pay additional fees. And we know the impact that we've had the last two years with COVID, you know, paying additional fee can be um, problematic for some organizations. So we don't want to see that happen. We're here to help the organization, help nonprofits succeed. And because we feel like the value that you add for the residents of North Carolina is immeasurable. And so our division, the motto is we're here to help any way we can to get you into compliance and to keep you there. So please use us as a resource, call us with any questions. It doesn't matter what it is. And if um, the document examiner can't help you, they don't have a problem, they will refer you, them, refer you to me. By the end of our conversation, we're gonna have a solution that's gonna be a win-win situation. So never ever be afraid to call you at, to ask your questions, whether it's to document examiners or to me. Okay, okay so, we talked about if the application, you know, was deficient and then ended up in a denial. But on the other hand, if everything is good, all the documentation is received, compliance is achieved, um, you receive your license. Now, the license is issued on by statute only for 12 months. Now, some of you may have heard the term short license. And what that means is that Every organization has an annual renewal date, and that date is established by your, uh, according to your physical year in, how you file your um, taxes. If for some reason you do not file at your prescribed uh, renewal period, you may be two months late. So your license will be what we call a short license. It's going to be from that time you file that license to your end date, your normal annual end date. It cannot be issued for more than 12 months according to statute. So, and then you may have a license. So for instance, we have this scenario um, occasionally where an organization may be six months late from filing. And so their license that they have is only issued, gonna be issued for six months. Within six months, they're gonna to have to renew again on the annual renewal date. And oftentimes they don't understand why because they figure they just renewed, it should be for 12 months. But according to statute, it cannot be because if we do that, it's gonna be like 18 months that you actually have a license and we can't do it by statute. Okay, the other thing here is that any license that's issued is not gonna be issued in the DBA. You may be doing business as one, under one name, but you have your legal name. Any license that's issued is gonna be in the legal name. Um, say United Way of North Carolina, do a business as Triangle Artworks, for example. So that name is gonna be United Way of North Carolina versus what you're actually doing business in. And then also, um, must contain original signatures. Okay, skip that one. Okay. 
how often do I need to register? Again, um, the annual renewal of a license is required. And again, it's set by your fiscal year end date. And we will talk more about that later in the presentation. Also, the other question becomes about exempt organization. Those organizations that have received an exemption, they are not required to renew. If they meet the, the statutory requirements for an exempt organization, um, is their option to uh, renew on an annual basis. So regardless if you're licensed or exempt, the renewal period doesn't change, it's an annual renewal. But for exempt organization, it's an option because you're not required as long as you meet the criteria to be exempt. Okay, so how, how do I determine my renewal date? And here's an example here. So I'm just gonna take an organization whose physical year end in December 31, from January to December 31 of any given year. According to our statute, is that if your fiscal year end is December, then five months later, which is the month of May, on the 15th day of that month, which is May 15th, that's gonna be your annual renewal day. So every year on May 15th, you will be required to renew your charitable solicitation license. If you are exempt, then you're required, well not required, but you may, you have your option, it's optional that you renew your exemption May 15th of every year. So having said that, um, so the next question is, we get a lot, well, can I get an extension? Well, CSL, the statute provides for 60 day or 90 day extension. The difference is you automatically get the 60 day extension is built into the statute. So if your renewal date is May 15th of any given year and you don't, you're not ready to quite file at that time, then you have until July 15th, that's your 60 day, but on July 16th, if you have not renewed at that time, then you're subject for the $25 late fee that starts uh, accruing. In the event that you say, okay, I see that I'm, I'm still not ready to file for renewal, can I get the other 30 days extension? So how you get that is you have to submit form 8868, which is um, the form that organizations normally submit to IRS saying we want extension, uh, extension of time to file our 990. If you submit that to IRS and send that to us, then we can give you by statute, we can give you an additional 30 days. So overall, you can get up to 90 days to file your um, annual renewal license application. One thing I wanna say here, at one point, like two years ago, we were in sync with IRS filing. Um, IRS changed not long ago their extension dates. So now they're giving organizations about six months to file their 990s. And it's in conflict with the current statute that we have on the books. And so um, say for instance, May 15th by statute for us, you have until July 15th, where IRS is giving you until November the 15th to file your 990. You see that conflict? Whereas we're expecting to have it in by July 15th, but IRS give you until November 15th. So therefore, organizations oftentimes are not ready to renew their application with CSL. So we do re realize that that is a major problem um, for um, organizations. And so this year, what we've done is we, we, we kind of slowed down on enforcement action for that very reason. And so even though we cannot physically give you until November 15th, what we've decided to do in some cases is put organizations in a holding status until November 15th. We haven't denied you, but we just put you in a holding status. And we feel like that's one way because of COVID, everything is going on. That's one way we can kind of work with organizations and not cause a problem for them in terms of them being able to submit their financial documents, which is needed in order to pursue their license renewal. So major conflict there. And um, we're hoping that at some point in time, we can get that changed with the legislatures 
So that is a goal of CSL is to have our filing dates, um, extension dates match IRS to ease the burden for nonprofits. Okay, so what happens if I fail to renew past the extension time? Again, as I said, past extension date, whether it's the 60 day or 90 days, on the 16th day, if we still don't have your application, you're subject for $25 late fee according to the statute. And so um, here, there's a little example there, you know, May 15th filing date, you have until July 15th. On July 16th, we don't have your application, you start accruing the $25 late fee. Now we do realize that um, that could be massive because we've had some organizations that have been expired for an extended period of time. So instead of continuously charging organizations $25 a month, we just cap the late fee at $900 and stop it there. And so the um, normally this is about a three year period of being out of compliance. So we're hoping that we see less and less of this. We don't have a great deal, but we hope to see less and less of this occurrence taking place because we want to work with organizations to get them into compliance or for them to withdraw and that way the late fees stop. Okay, so a brief recap of what we've done so far is that um, we've covered CSL, a little bit about CSL, the staffing. We talked about a little bit about business registration and what's happening with business formation. Definitions, we discussed contributions, solicitation, registration. And also when we talk about registration, we talked about how to register, who must register, the benefits of registration. Uh, we talked about exemptions. We talked about what constitute an executive director as far as compensation and charitable contributions. Uh, we talked about renewals and extensions, the application process, paper versus online filing, and a complete, what constitutes a complete application. We talked a little bit about insufficiency and denial notices. So now what we're going to cover is disclosures, uh, record keeping, uh, using professional fundraisers, enforcement action, best practices, and some common mistakes that we see on our applications. Okay, so um, we don't get this question often, but we do get it. And so we talk about disclosure statements and the solic solicitation of contributions um, can be for an express period. At any time of solicitation, the disclosure must be made. You must have the name of the charitable organization on your documentation. You must have the state and the principal place of business of the charity and the description of the purpose for which the solicitation is being made. Because you know, one of the things that you know, I think you can agree with is that it's really sad for a donor to feel that they're given for one cause and the organization take those funds and use it for a different purpose, then the donor doesn't feel secure and they're given. And then, you know, that sets up for complaints and things like that. And so we don't want that to happen. And so that's why this disclosure statement was created. Now, another thing is disclosures. Now, upon request, we, the Charitable Solicitation License Division, CSL, we can ask for a copy of your disclosure statement to see what's on it. Now, the name and either the address or telephone number of a representative whom you, um, whom inquires can be addressed should be there. The amount of the contribution, uh, which may be deducted uh, by, as a charitable contrib uh, uh, contribution should be there. So as much information you can provide to that donor is better for everybody because it's like transparency and make the donor feel better about giving. Okay. And then say for instance, upon request, uh, <clears throat> we can also ask for the source, a written financial statement um, that tells us about what happened in the previous fiscal year. Um, we can ask to see your, your 990. We can ask to see an audit. We can ask to see a financial document at any time. So whether it's us or the public coming in, you should be, the organization should be prepared to answer these questions because um, it is public information. The donor has a right to know. Um, and so you want to be prepared and know what information is available. You should be made available should it, uh, um, you get that request from the public. And again, you can read the rest of this, but some other information as it goes to disclosure statements. 
Okay. Printed disclosures. You know. So every charitable organization or sponsor is required to obtain a license. Shall, you know, make it obvious, display, you know, your disclosure statement. You know, according to our statute, it has to be a minimum of nine points. Now, some people put eight, six, you can't do that. It should be a minimum of nine points. It should be legible. People should be able to read that statement should they need to um, have questions and want to find out more information. In that statement, it's going to be printed solicitation, written confirmation, receipt, or reminder. It doesn't matter which format you have it in. It's just that it should be contain the information that was speak, uh, previously talked about. It should also be a minimum of nine point. And then this statement that I have here in the blue is required by law to be on your um, solicitation material. This number here comes back to CSL. A lot of times we get chaired, I mean, um, donors call as well. I made a donation to here and they told me to call this number. Should I have questions? And so a lot of times we had to ask, you know, what is your concern? What is your question? And what we do is we try to go through our database and see what information is there to answer their questions and make them feel secure about their giving. Uh, we're not always able to do that because, you know, particularly with some out-of-state entities, but for the most part, um, by having this number there and having those donors um, call in, we can kind of filter the questions out, we can kind of answer the questions, we can kind of make them feel secure based upon the information in our database. And so again, that goes to um, how valuable it is to have a complete application from the charity and you know, to clearly state your purpose, clearly state how the funds are gonna be used, um, answer the question about the board members, who has responsibility for uh, handling contributions or disbursement of contributions. So those things, you know, reason we ask those questions, we can kind of answer a lot of questions for those donors when it comes to our attention. Okay, so record keeping, you know, another question that we get off often is how long should I keep records? So charities and professional fundraisers are required to keep records of activities in the state for a minimum of three years. And um, also it should be made available upon request. So even on our notary page, there is um, a statement there to this effect too, because we wanna make sure that charities are aware that the notary page, even for online files particular, if we don't receive your original copy, you're required to hold that notary page somewhere in your possession at your entity in your office. Everyone should know where it is for three years. So at any point in time, if we question a signature for, for any reason, or if we get a, a, a complaint about your organization and we question a signature, then we can come back and say, hey, I need you to, to send this in. We need to verify the signature. So you need to make that available. And then at the same time, anytime that CSM makes a request, um, you are to, to respond within 10 days after that request is made. So we don't do this often. So for the most part, I can say that the charities in North Carolina you know, do a, a fabulous job. I'm not saying all, that's not inclusive of everyone because we do have some bad actors out there. But for the most part, the charities in North Carolina does a pretty good job of um, providing information that's needed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about professional fundraisers. We have two categories and oftentimes people get these two areas kind of confused because they overlap in some of their functions and duties. The two categories are fundraising consultants and solicitors. Um, both are required to register, both are required to pay an annual fee each year. And their license fee is $200. It doesn't matter if you're a fundraising consultant or solicitor. And for the solicitor, the major difference is a bond is required. Okay, so let's talk about the fundraising consultant. You know, so the consultant, their main purpose is they help a charity organize their campaign materials that they're gonna be sending out for solicitation they cannot themselves participate in that solicitation. They can't, I mean, they can't participate directly or indirectly. They can't ask any organization or entity for funds on behalf of the charity. They cannot 
uh, manage any of the funds that's received as uh, uh, in, um, as a consequence of that um, solicitation campaign. All they can do is help plan the campaign, manage the campaign, conduct documentation, and prepare the material to submit to the organization for them to carry out the solicitation component. They cannot handle the, they can't do the asking, nor can they handle the money. Now, on the other hand, when you talk about solicitors, this is different. The reason that the solicitor is required to have a bond is because they can handle the money. And anytime you have an entity or a person handling money on behalf of you or your organization, you want to make sure that they are bonded. Because if anything happens, you want to have some recourse to be able to get your money back or some type of some level of protection for you. And that's why they're required to have a bond. So again, the solicitor can do everything that the fundraiser consultant can do. They can um, plan the activities. They can employ people to help carry out the activities. They can ask directly or indirectly for the funds. They can have and manage the money in their possession. So the solicitor have, have more responsibility. And so, um, and, and there's nothing wrong. It all depends on what the organization needs. You know, for a race consultant may be your know, best avenue, the system may be your best avenue, but it's the organization themselves who would decide which route to go as far as a professional professional fundraiser is, is concerned. So the other issue is that we get some questions about grant writers. And so they want to know if a grant writer is required to be licensed or not. And so the grant writer is exempt if they are employed by the charity, even if they're compensated by the charity, that's fine. But they are employed by the charity and they're submitting, <coughs> excuse me, grant applications to government or 501c3 organizations. In that scenario, they're not required to be licensed at all. On the other hand, they're required to be licensed as a fundraiser consultant if they're in a grant writing business. That all they're doing is writing grants. They're not contacting over the organization, well, submitting applications to corporations, but they're not asking for the money, play, I mean, handling the money. They're required to be a fundraiser consultant there, licensed as a fundraiser consultant. But again, if they're employed by the charity and they're only submitting grant applications to the government agencies like federal, state, and local governments, and then to 501c3s, then they're not required to be licensed. Okay, so let's talk about enforcement. So again, with compliance, we do have issues with enforcement. We do have that occurring. And so we have to have a way to respond. Um, and here, it could come in the form of complaints. It could come in the form of internally where organizations are not in compliance. And so we have a process that we follow. So for expired charities, what we do, we send out reminder notices that your registration has expired. We send out, if we don't have a response within maybe 15 days and we send out a final warning notice. Another 15 days, then we send out notice of intent with a draft administrative order telling you what your violations are and the potential of penalties that could be enacted should we proceed with the um, administrative order. And the last one is administrative order, and that's when the penalties kick in. And so we, we don't like to go that route because we feel that, you know, we give you enough opportunity to get into compliance. And here again, Regardless of if you get one of these notices or not, we always ask the charity to call us, to contact us, be, you know, communicate with us because our number one job is to work with you to see what the problem is, how can we assist you? We are here to assist you to get into compliance. So never feel bad. We have some entities that are so um, scared they go and get an attorney. Um, it's not necessary, you know, but, you know, but they didn't know that. And it made them feel secure and someone speaking on their behalf, being a voice piece on their behalf. And that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. We will address those issues with the attorney if that's you know, what's needed. But we want to convey that CSL, we are, we are customer friendly. We are here for you. We work for you. 
We want to interact with you and we are here just to assist you in any way possible. So we have that open door, never be afraid to call ever. And then if one person can't help, like a document examiner can't help, by the time you get to my desk, we should have a win-win situation when you hang up that phone call. So rarely do we not um, find a solution for you. We, we have a workaround, we'll find something because again, we believe in compliance. We believe in the work that you do. We want you to continue to do the work. We want you to grow and be successful. That's what our role is here, not to be a hindrance to you. So I don't like to, to focus on enforcement steps, but just know they are there. And, and we have the capability of doing um, um, assessing penalties and, and such as that. Along with that, these are some of the type of, of enforcement actions, you know, we administrative order. If we get to that route, the minimum violation uh, penalty would be $1,000. And we can do that for each um, violation that occurs. We can issue a cease and assist order. We can refuse to register. We can cancel or suspend your registration. Uh, we can place you on probation for a period of time. We can issue a letter of concern. We can cancel an exemption if, if you are exempt. So these are things that we, we can do. We don't like to go that route, but they are available to us, tools for us if we need to. So we're now, we're coming to a close. I'm on, I know we pretty much at that one o'clock hour, um, getting about five minutes, 10 minutes, we'll be done. So one of the things that we found in best practices, a lot of information that I'm gonna be going over is very, um, it's not difficult information. However, I think people are speeding through the application. They may not be reading the questions in its totality. So they're missing little small pieces, but, and we can't, you know, process an application or issue a license because by statute, these pieces of information, no matter how small they are, minor they are, are required by statute. So therefore, I just want to put out there, these are some of the common mistakes that we find, particularly on questions 18 through 23. You know, list states, other states that you may be <coughs> um, soliciting in. Don't, we've said, don't put a street address. Do not put a PO box, you know, so, Please read that carefully, put a street address. Um, and then sometimes, say for instance, if you accidentally put a PO box by one of your board members, at the very bottom of that document say, you can use the physical, ad physical address of the organization, of the charity, to contact any of the above board members. And that would take care of that, whether, it's a, whether there's a PO box there or not. So, if you have any five board members, you put five physical addresses, you're fine. You have five board members, you put four physical addresses in one PO box, but at the bottom of your document, you said you can contact any of the above at the organiza physical organization for the charity, then you're fine again. And then also be careful, anytime a question asks for a telephone number, please include that there. We have a lot of people that missed that question as well. Okay. Um, be specific in providing contact information for final responsibility or custodian of records. So that's often missed. Um, the financials, we ask you to be conscious of which financial you provide, even though, you know, we have organizations want to get in compliance so bad, they try to supply two years of the, the, the financial documents from two years prior. We can't take that. It has to be the current physical year. So that's another thing, the appropriate tax year. Um, and then for the 990 itself, you know, an officer has to sign it. We get a lot of 990s that are not signed. Sometimes in lieu of the 990s being signed, they submit a form 8879, which, you know, that's for exempt organization. So we can take that. So, but, you know, one or both of these documents must be signed. Uh, best practice, okay. With the 990, um, it's statutorily required to just submit the Schedule A. We have those missing quite a bit. The next one is a large one. The e-postcard, Form 990N, we cannot take that as a financial document. And the reason being, again, there's a conflict in statute between IRS and the state statute that we operate under. IRS says on the 990 that if your organization receive less than $50,000 in contributions on an annual basis, then you can, you can submit this form instead of a, a 990. For our statute, if you make over 25,000, I mean, less than $25,000, that's when we say you are exempt. And so 
if you submit a 990 into us, we don't know what your level of income is. We don't know if it's 26,000 to 50,000. We don't know if it's 25,000 or less. So we have no way of knowing what your contribution level is. That's why we cannot accept Form 990 in. So in, in lieu of this, we have a North Carolina annual report form that you can fill out and submit that in lieu of the 990. And that's what I'm just speaking of right here. But on that form itself, the common mistake that we find is line 47. It must be totals all the way across, even if some of those totals are zero. Do not leave it blank because we, we don't know. We can't interpret what that means if it should or should not be blank. So if it's zero, put a zero there. And then the other um, issue with the um, North Carolina Annual Report form is line 54, where people often forget the signatures and dates. So again, line 47 and line 54 are the two common areas that we find uh, missing information on this form. Okay, so here, what financial documents do I submit? There are three forms, the 990, an audited financial statement or the North Carolina Annual Report form. Any of those three documents we can take as a financial document in support of your licensure application. And again, you know, be conscious of the year. Say for instance, we're in um, the filing period for 2020 to 2021. I mean, I, I should say 2022, 2021, 2022. So no, for right now we're in 2020, 2021, we need your 2020 financials. Okay, so always remember that whatever following year we're in, we need the previous year financials. And again, oh, sorry. And again, you can submit the North Carolina Annual Report form in lieu of the 990 or the audit. And um, the charity themselves are the ones who will confirm that that information is accurate at the time of reporting. And in, in some instances, if we question that information, we may do a records request or ask you to explain, you know, um, any question that we have regarding your finan financial documents. Okay, so now we're down to the five common mistakes. Um, number one, misinformation or lack of knowledge of the licensure requirements and therefore it's listed in North Carolina without a license. So we do realize that there are many entities across the state of North Carolina who still don't know who CSL is or um, what the purpose of this division is. So we have a lot of organizations out there that are still soliciting without a license. And, it's, and you know, they just don't know, they're not aware. So one of the things that we're hoping that you will help us do is, you know, anyone you come in contact with, your general conversation, just mention CSL and registration. So we would appreciate that because we believe word of mouth is the best way of getting this knowledge out to people. And um, so solution, you know, go to our website, call us if need to. Number two, um, contracting with unlicensed fundraising consultant or solicitor. Both the charity and the fundraising professional fundraiser are subject to be penalized. The charity cannot work with an unlicensed solicitor or fundraising consultant, nor vice versa. So both the, the um, charity and a professional fundraiser, whether it's a fundraising consultant or solicitor, must be licensed in order to work together and solicit for charitable contributions. Again, you know, go to our website on the charities for more information. Uh, <clears throat> and number three, the top third um, mistake is mis misinformation or underlicensed. You know, that licensure application is really key to um, getting information and being successful, that, that you don't get an insufficiency letter, that you don't end up being denied and have to pay a license fee all over again. So in the event, please, if you get an insufficiency letter, call us. We, we're here for you and resource for you. Number four, not renewing um, an existing license or exemption by the time, um, the renewal date. Again, we're here for you. Call us. And the fifth, failing to respond to a CSL, CSL inquiry. Again, um, we're here as a resource. There's no need to be afraid. Call us, it doesn't matter what the question is, we're here for you. And that concludes my presentation. So I know it's long and I apologize for that, but 
it has a lot, I try to be detailed of some of the information in those slides so that you can go back and kind of have an understanding of what's going on. But if you have questions, we're here for you. So Beth, I turn it back over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Gail. That was a lot of great information. And I feel like I know the CSL process and I learned some things, so thank you for that. Um, and I know there are, in your effort to sort of get the word out, I know there are a lot of people on this call who are um, in a position that they can help share that word too. So we're, we're, and I'm sure they'll all be glad to be doing that. We do have a couple questions and I have one. Um, one is back to the question of ex exemption, that $25,000. So can you just go back over about the $25,000? Is that in, in gross receipts or what is the $25,000? Yeah, so the $25,000 is in total. There's monetary and in-kind donations, any combination thereof. So is, if it's $25,000 or more, that's when you're required to be licensed. If it's $25,000 or less, even if it's $24,999, it's less than $25,000. But so, so it's not, oh God, I'm sorry. No, so the $25,000, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the $25,000, so you, you mentioned government grants and some grants may not be included in that. So that's just private donations? That's right, that's right. So if, if you have a, a $25,000 in charitable contributions, if it includes any state, local or federal grants, if it includes any monies from another 501c3 organization tax that you know has that tax determination status, those are not counted toward contributions. So if your $25,000, say 15,000 is in government grants and 10,000 is in private donations or um, in-kind donations. The only thing that's gonna be counted is that $10,000, not the 15. So therefore you do qualify for an exemption. Okay. As long as you do not compensate, that's the other question. So it's, you know, you know, gotta go down to the sliding scale list. You know, am I compensating? You know, um, where are my money's coming from? and then go from there. And again, like I said, I really want to stress and emphasize, um, always call if you have a question about the contributions, where they're coming from and if they're going to be counted. We'll be happy to answer that question. Um, next question is um, do, about dic disclosures. Uh, it yes. says, does that entire disclosure need to be in each communication or can it be in one place like the website? It should be on the communicate. If you send out, like for instance, if you have a brochure, it should be on your brochure somewhere. If you send out information, uh, we get this question a lot. If you send out information like via um, online flyers and things, it should be there somewhere. So any form of communication that you have, if it's written, you should have that disclosure statement there somewhere about the organization. Okay, one more question. Um... So do employees and trustees of an organization have to maintain individual solicitation licenses or only no. well let me, hang on, let me finish make sure I'm right or only contracted fundraisers solicitors outside of the employee trustees that the organization may recruit so i think your okay. answer is so if you are employed by a charitable organization you're employed by them you can solicit for them as much as possible you're not required to have like, long as that organization has a license, you fall under their spectrum, their license. So you can do all the soliciting on their behalf on that license. Now, if that organization works with an outside fundraising consultant or professional or, um, or solicitor, then both entities are required to have a license, the organization and the professional fundraiser, whether they're a fundraising consultant or if they are a solicitor, they both are required to be licensed with CSL. So there would be an or, yeah, organizational license and then the separate license for the for yes. any contracted or... Yes. And I guess the license. question is... Because the... look at it like this, that fundraiser consultant or that professional solicitor, they can have multiple clients. You may not be their only client. You may start out being, you could be the first, but you may not be their last client client. So therefore, they need to have their separate license to say they can, you know, have all of these contracts with different entities. You may be one of 10, you may be one of 30, you may be one of one. But nonetheless, 
those professional fundraisers have to have their individual separate license apart from the charitable organization. Okay. And I think that is all the questions that are in the chat, unless there's, I don't see any more. Um, and, and I do want to, uh, and you mentioned it a couple of times, but I, as I said, I know, um, and you and I have talked about that, um, because we have, and I'm sure some of you listening have had organizations come to you as, as Gail says, that have never heard of the CSL licensing requirement and are suddenly panicked, uh, about, uh, what to do and enforcement and, you know, getting in trouble <laughs> and, as, as Gail has made clear, I mean, although they do have enforcement um, tools and jurisdiction, um, they certainly, as, as I think you said to me, Gail, it would, it's better for them to come, come to us and ask for help than for someone to report them later. And, and so um, yes. Gail's made very clear that, you know, they are there to help um, nonprofits uh, stay in, get in compliance, stay in compliance, and um, they're glad to help out. Yes, yes, and that we want to stress that we're we're here to serve you. Use us as a tool, and also on our website there's some FAQs, which you know um, may explain some things too that some questions you have. But always, never be afraid to call CSL for anything the question that you have, or you can shoot us an email. You know whichever one you feel more comfortable doing, that's fine. Um, but we're here to assist you. But like I said, the number one thing is compliance. We want to be here as a resource for you. We want to make sure that we get all your questions answered. And at the same time, we love the work that the nonprofits have been, those gaps that the nonprofits have been filling for a lot of agencies that can't reach at the population that you're reaching. They can't do the work that you're doing. So that's why, again, we want to do everything we can to assist nonprofits in achieving their goals. Perfect. One one more question. Well, I guess two more questions came in. Um, one is is how how does the license how does it because how's the license impacted or or how do you address um, fundraisers where the funds are being collected by one charitable organization but then split or dispersed with another charitable organization? So I guess the question is there is who you know how do you figure out what what the final I guess <clears throat> charitable income is. Um, okay, read the question for me again. I want to make sure I understand what they're asking. Well, it says, how does this impact? I assume they, it means how, how does the, how is the money counted? How does this impact fundraisers where the funds are being collected by one charitable organization, but then split dispersed with another charitable organization? Okay, it almost sounds as if they're talking about um, like um, a federated organization or, or a consolidated filing, depending on, say for instance, um, United Way, for example, collects a lot of money from different organizations. They could collect money from some 501c3s. They can get federal state grants. They can get corporate grants. But the money they get as a 501c organization, they have a list of other charities that they send money out to. So who they send the money out to, they have a list of those organizations, kind of like federated organizations. Uh, um, United Way is the head, and they have a list of their, I don't want to say members, but affiliates that they work with and they support. And so they have a filing, then they list on their 990 who they're giving money to. So that's a prime example of one organization collecting a lot of money and splitting it among other organizations right there. Now, if you're saying, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a professional fundraiser, like say for instance, a solicitor. That solicitor is soliciting on behalf of an individual charity. They may have five or, five or six or more, but they keep the funds separate according to the individual they're, they're soliciting for, and then disperse according to that. At no point in time can they solicit on behalf of one organization, take those funds that was meant for that organization and give it to another one. They cannot, that's, a, that's against the law. And it's, it's um, used, not using the donor's uh, funds as it was intended to do. So again, they set themselves up for violation. But I'm hoping that I answer your question. If not, um, my contact information, Beth will make it available to you. Feel free to call me, we can discuss it further. But I hope I answered your question. Um, well, it, I think it sounds like that if, 
taking into account what you said about you know assuming that the the money was intended the, the donor knew, knew it was going to you that the money that comes into your organization is the money you report yes so, um and finally we have a question um because it's a lot of information and and it's all great information it's a lot of information we we have uh folks asking um if we can get, they can get a copy of your slides i'd be happy to and that's why i try to put them a little detail because if you use them and it can help you navigate the system, that's fine. Not a problem at all. And if you have any question on anything that's in there, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to go over with you for clarity. Because I believe, you know, like when I was growing up, they always say each one teach one, right? Mm -hmm. So if I share information with you and then in having a conversation with you, I learn from you at the same time, I know how to do my job better. So that's why I like that communication. So my slides, definitely you can have them. Have any questions, let me know. If I need to tweak something based upon conversation, trust me, I, 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 welcome, I welcome information. I welcome knowledge back from the charity world because you're doing the work. So I need to know if the information I presented makes sense to you. So yes, you can have the slides, not a problem. Okay. And we will be sending, um the slides as well as a link to the to the uh, recording on YouTube, um, as well as Gail's contact information out to everybody, as well as you'll be getting, I think pretty much automatically after this program, you'll be getting a survey, but watch for a follow up email from us. Um, and before we close, I just want to say I know a number of you are uh, arts uh, nonprofit leaders and uh, we have three more programs in this arts administrator series. One of the speakers is on the head of Random is on this call, um, and she'll be talking about you know capacity building and and growth for small and mid-sized organizations. Uh, we have a program coming up on board. Um, I think Maggie's still on this call. One of our speakers on on you know sort of board development, and then um, we have a program after the first of the year on uh, development and. Um, um, particularly on major gifts. And so those are very, um, gonna be great programs, very affordable, and we hope, and we'll see y'all on those calls too. And final thank you to Gail. I mean, I really appreciate this. There's been a lot of information. A lot of us really need it. I'm happy to be able to get it out to a broader audience on, on YouTube. So thanks to everybody for coming um, and we'll see you next month. Thank you everyone. And feel free to contact us if you need us. Thanks.